for coming to my talk. I am David Ferber, and I live in Ithaca, New York. I work for a software consulting company called Gorgeous. Ithaca is gorgeous, so Gorgeous is uh, Ithaca. And I'm going to be talking to you about rapid data modeling and active record with the JSON data type, specifically the JSON data type in Postgres. Another title could be how I sped up my Rails development by fitting a document store into my active record models. And I'll fill in the blanks there as I go along, but I'm going to mainly tell a story of some projects out of which this emerged. Okay? Ithaca, maybe you've heard of it, maybe you've not. It's a small city in upstate New York. It's a, yay. A bus ride away from New York City, so we get a lot of, of business from there. And it's the home of Cornell University and Ithaca College, so we get a lot of stuff from there. It tends to be academic stuff. It tends to be often small to medium-sized stuff for which Rails can cut right through. So we have a, a, a Rails toolkit that we use to, to do it. And so everything for me is often about how to get this done as fast as possible, because I'm often working on three or four or six or even eight things at a time, and, and, and I need to get through. So rapid data modeling, even before you get up to rapid data modeling, there's a lot of things to do before you would think of such a thing that I thought I would go through. I'm a big fan of simple form and learning you know, how simple form works beyond just the the uh, top of the README in terms of how you can use it to make your, well, your form simple, but more on that later. And Slim for templating because it removes a lot of the extra stuff and taking advantage of the view template inheritance in Rails to minimize the amount of views. And I like to take uh, common components and put them in engines like uh, CK Editor. Every time I start a new project, and I push it up, it take, to Heroku, how long does it take to build? And sometimes it started timing out. So we created a, an engine and put CK Editor, or you know, what we use on, on, uh, on a CDN. And whenever we need it, we just plug it in. And uh, I say don't waste work. The things I'm going to tell you about rapid data modeling with Postgres, I'm not doing any of it with the intention of simply prototyping it and throwing it away at a later time, but of of using the JSON in order to build something. And I suggest always to keep reading the instructions, even if you started learning Rails at 1.2 or 2 or 3, they're always adding new things. And this is a story of how sitting down and reading what came out in Rails 4 helped me solve a problem. And of course, inherited resources, I'm a fan of that. The projects I'm talking about use that. I noticed that it's come out of fashion lately. If you go to the project on GitHub, it says, please don't use this anymore. And so I tried to cut back. Also, the 10th time trying to explain to new developers what an association chain is caused me to uh, back away as well. But the, the model works. And most often, when you have a lot of little projects, I've found, try to be consistent in the way that you do things on all of the projects so that when you parachute in, the things are where they need to be. Now, last spring, I got involved with a project, Project Aragat. Like many of our projects, this was, you know, somebody at Cornell got a grant, and they had a project that had been evolving over the years, and they needed to somebody to come in and clean it up and make it work. And this particular one was the archaeology department. Some archaeologists there, uh, two of them, go every year and have been since 1995. They've skipped some years, but they've been going to, uh, to Aragat, which is one of the areas of the oldest human settlements, going back to like 8,000 BC. And they do field work, and they, they collect artifacts, and then they've been describing them in a first a Microsoft Access database that then went to Microsoft Excel, and they, they valently did it all themselves, and with all you know, respect, but it needed a database person to 
look at it and clean it up, and they wanted to expand it and be able to uh, search on it more efficiently than they could. They didn't want to have to learn SQL in order to keep searching for their data, and they wanted it to be publicly available to other researchers so that they could put it in their footnotes and stuff. So let me bring you into the world of archaeology real quick. Last, last summer, when we were working on this, they took a, a drone with them to Armenia, and thanks to the time that we saved them with the uh, system, they were able to fly the drone around. And here, when an archaeologist, you know, data modeling for an archaeologist, what you're seeing here, well, is a, it looks like a tundra, but that would be, they go and they look around and they see, oh, here's a place where there's some human settlement. And this site, they call it a landscape. And here's another one. And they survey a bunch of these sites, and then they decide when they go in a particular year, which ones look interesting. So there's a database of surveys of sites that they've looked up, prospective places to dig. And then they decide, okay, this year we're going to focus on that one and this one, and that would be called an operation. And then in this operation, they're going to go and set up their tents and, and stakes in the ground and measure and start to do some preliminary digging and say, oh, here, you know, this place looks interesting, and this little place looks interesting, and this little place looks interesting within that confined landscape. And then they're going to start digging with their picks and toothbrushes and whatnot. This, you see that there's a little animal kind of running along. They totally weren't meaning to film a Discovery Channel type of thing, but uh, it was fun. So this application is going to be used for, you know, they, they take all the, the pot shards and whatever, and they put them in bags and boxes, and they bring them back to the tents. And then in the evening, they get out some beer, and they uh, can turn on the television and start measuring and guessing what, you know, what is this and cataloging. So I, they have an application where they go load up to the place that they're at. And you know, all the different things that they can find there, they can add, add them. So lots of different things meant to be used in action but also meant to be used to answer questions like, okay, you know, last year, Bronze Age pots with rolled rims, I need to be able to find that without writing SQL. So there needed to be this uh, very fancy, and at the beginning of it, very intimidating <laughs> search interface to write. So the things that they find, and of course, there are some English and Russian things going on that it's not just in English or in Russian, but the things that are in Russian are presented also in English. And you choose what kind of thing you're looking for, and then you can apply many filters. And when you click Add Attribute, then you get a lot of different choices. And then you can pick your filter and check your list of things, and click Submit, and you will get results. So things, lots of different things. In archaeology, they, here's some of the kinds of things that they can find at a site, from a bone, which they call fauna, or a bone object, which is an object made from bone, or pottery, which is seldom coming out in, as a pot shells, wood objects, all different kinds of things that they find. So all of these things, there's some metadata about them that, are, that everything has. Everything has a period in which they guess that it might have started being from and a period in which it ended. If they're really sure that it's from the early Bronze Age, those would be the same, for example. But everything gets periodized and what place they found it at and anything else that all of these things have, who found it, would be on there, but then each of these things, everything else is different. And these things can have a lot, a lot of attributes about them. Here's, you know, it's just a pot, right? But when an archaeologist looks at it and they see pinch handles and grip handles, and I'm not even sure what those are, and outpour positions, and what is it a lid, is it a neck, and core bands and colors, and you know, there's dozens of attributes on here. And 
you know, a bone is just as complex as that, and whether it's been butchered, and you know, how it was butchered, and what it was butchered with, and I, it blew my mind how much they uh, do. And I had originally started with having each of these things in its own table. Actually, somebody else had started the schema, and that's how it was when I got it. And then for the searching the things in common, they had this thing called an object registry. And uh, I was trying to, you know, wrecking my mind, you know, with the forms and hooking us all up and make, making the search interface when I read a blog post saying that you can do this in Postgres. And I was like, whoa, I, I wonder if I can use this. So here's an SQL query that's saying uh, if we have a single table with everything in it, all the attributes of everything, and we have a data column that's a JSON column, then we can actually search on the keys. Does anybody know you can do this? Has anybody done this? Okay. So I thought, well, I wonder if I can make Rails do that or active record easily. And so I sat down with a beer. I wanted to see if I could use a single table inheritance to have the stuff that's in common in actual database columns and then put everything that is a variant into this data column, okay? So I would have a common base class. We actually called it entity, but it was having trouble explaining what entities were, so I called it artifacts here. They call them objects, but in Ruby that's taken. So I had to, we had to say, well, guys, let's pick something else. And uh, we settled on entity. But artifact, I think, is clear from a, for a non-archaeologist. Pottery extends artifact. And, it, and all of the specific attributes will be in the data column. OK? So how can we do this? Well, let me tell you first, here's a migration that would create a column that would have a JSON column. Now, what is a JSON column? Has anybody ever stored JSON in the database before? Did you use a text column? Yes. I've, I have too. I had a slide in here earlier that said humans have long stored JSON as text in the database, but now you can actually store it as JSON. Now, Postgres 9.2, they introduced this JSON column. And all the JSON column really is is text. Postgres stores it as text just like you stored it when it was a text column. However, they provided a bunch of new functions that would allow you to search within the JSON and to, to work with the JSON and blow it out. You know, say that you have an array of JSON objects, you can blow it out as if in a query as if they're table rows, and you can select out the, the JSON as, and pretend that they're columns, all kinds of interesting things like that. But it was all still stored as text and parsed on demand like uh, Jameis with the presentation about the scrolls and that you make a query, it's got to open up all the scrolls with the JSON. However, you can index the individual keys if you want to, okay? JSON B came along in Postgres 9.4, and if you have no access to 9.4 and you want to work with JSON, use the JSON B because it gets stored as JSON, and that means faster searching. And it also allows you to create a, what's called a gin index. You can say index all of the keys in this JSON and lookups when you say find, find me a document with this key value pair in the JSON. It's actually faster, I found, than you know, doing it in regular columns, okay? But it's much slower if you're doing greater than and less than and stuff. I'll get to more of that later. But if you've got this JSON column, which here I call, I always call it data, then you can do something like this, store accessor data comma width. And when I saw that, I was like, I think I might be able to use this. What does this do? Well, let's say that we have our artifact, and we say pass in the width of 20. Whoa, artifact.width is 20. Cool. And there's no column for it. Data width, because it put it in, a, in the hash, which is your data field, and is serializing it to the JSON. So by the same token, you know, your HTML form with the width where the user typed 20 
it gets posted, it comes in as a string because Active Record doesn't know what to do with it because it's not an actual column, and it assigns it as 20, so you have a string of 20, and you ask for the width, it is 20. It's not an integer. Then you get wild and you ask if the width has changed, and it goes kaboom because it's not an actual attribute. It's just an accessor that gets stored in your data. However, data changed would become true. Otherwise, the active record won't know when to save the record. Now, I had to uh, have this massive search interface. Now, we're going to use Ransac somehow. Has anybody used Ransac? OK. So Ransac is a gem written by Ernie Miller that basically glues a form to, so you have an input that would be something like width greater than equal to like that. So you have the column and then a, what they call a predicate. And you, know, you can have a form input. And then when you say entity.ransac, then that drops into a rel and converts that into a where a width is greater than or equal to 30. And then call dot result, that pulls it back into active record land so that you can keep on adding scopes and stuff. It's a way to build advanced search filter type things. Okay? So I wanted it, I needed it to look like that so that I could use it with Ransack, and then my search problems would be solved if I was going to use this JSON column for storing attributes. And I found that you could with a custom ransacker. It's basically saying, OK, if you see width on my entity model, then please, when you make a query out of it, please change the word width with data, arrow, width, colon, colon, int. Now, what this is telling Postgres, you know, data, look for the width key in the data. It's going to come back as text and then convert that to an integer so that you can compare it to the integer that I gave you, OK? So put them together, and what do you get? The basis for a document store. The question is how to put them together, and what is a document store? So a doc document store is when you store, you don't have a schema necessarily, but you have, or at least it's defined in the model that says it has these keys and there's not columns in the database. I wanted to emphasize here that this is a hybrid, you know, schema mix type document store. Like, if you're going to use the JSON column, it doesn't mean you can't use the other columns or use columns like you normally do in Active Record. So if I was going to use this and it was actually going to be rapid data modeling, then I would need to have a quick way to declare what attributes go in my document, something kind of like uh, Active Model Serializers or Mongo Mapper or Mongoid. And I thought, well, OK, I need to typecast my data coming in and out, because it's probably coming in as a string, and I want it to be an integer. So and I need to convert it to something for a ransack to be able to search. Store accessor as a method, it turns out to be one of those methods in Rails. You, you go to the Rails internals, and you sometimes it's like, ooh, what is that? But this turned out to simply wrap up two methods called read store attribute and write store attribute. And I found that, oh, I could just uh, do the same thing and just catch it before it goes in and catch it when it comes out and make it what I want it. And then I can declare a custom ransacker, and that would allow me to do something like this with the integer attributes, width, length, width, and height. And then I also have string attributes and float attributes and Boolean attributes and so forth. So I thought, well, this might work as a, you know, as a template method where I have to define what goes into the blanks. And then integer attributes and string attributes would just fill in what those blanks are. 
In reality, it turned out to be a little more complicated because there is no dot to bool kind of thing, and to a, a date conversion is a little more complicated than just calling to date on whatever. But the end result is a model that looks something like that. And that's actually how the models look in this project. And it got the work done. But I wasn't really happy with it. It kind of bugged me that the, the implementation to me seemed to be driven by those blanks that I needed to fill in. And so, you know, string attributes, Boolean attributes, float attributes. It seemed to me that Boolean string float would be like the argument, you know, the first argument of a common method that could be called something like attribute. And doing it this way, rather than grouping the attributes by semantically where they are in the meaning of that document, instead I've grouped the strings and the, you know, grouped them together by type. And I asked myself, what was Sandy Metz do? Apparently I'm not the only one that ever asked themselves that. There's even a, you know, a, a sticker that I just got. But what was, what was Sandy Metz do? I had just watched her last uh, RailsConf talk on Confreaks, and the, the refactoring she did, you know, one of the stages was pretty much what, you know, what this was. It's like, okay, we're almost there, but not quite. What if it looks something more like that, where it's declaring each attribute one by one along with what it is, and that would give a place to add more interesting things like default arguments, and make it easier to come up with different types of attributes. I found that once I found that once I had the ability to say, you know, create my own essentially column types within my document and store them how I like, that I could be more creative in making the models, you know, fit. And that, you know, that refactoring that you saw there did not happen on this project, the code of a ceramic object doesn't look like that. It's the next project where I got to keep on taking it further. And this was for the Inclusive Recreation Resource Center, which is based in Cortland, New York, runs out of SUNY Cortland, or the State University of New York College at Cortland. And their mission is to make possible that the, you know, the picture that you see there is, can happen. That to have a database, a map of places that you can go if you have special needs for access and to assess them to find out is the bowling alley really accessible or are they just saying it's accessible? Is it really like that? <laughs> you can say that's accessible but somebody really ought to come and measure it, right? So that then, when we have a need, we want to go to a state park, we can type in Lake Placid and see what comes up and find out, is there really an accessible bathroom there that I can go to should I load up my minivan and drive out there, okay? And part of this website is for, you know, an online course for training the assessors, Another part is for actually making the assessments. And these assessments have a lot of forms, like this many forms. This is just the beginning of one of the forms. And there's like a PDF. You know, took a picture of the finders with some of those forms. And many of these have multiple pages. Now, what are they? You know, as you see by some of the names, a gazebo, a picnic shelter, a gift shop, pro shop, locker, shower, changing room, picnic area, overlook, shopping facility, fauna, amusement ride. There are a lot of different things, but many of them are, well, they're all physical places. Many of them are physical structures, buildings, and buildings tend to have some common elements. We noticed that when we were looking at the forms as we were overcoming you know, you know, our initial shock at seeing how many forms there were. And when do we have to get this done by? 
and how many migrations do we have to write to fit all this data? And then as we were actually reading the forms, seeing, oh, these questions are kind of similar to those questions, and kind of those questions. Oh, they're always asking about the door. And can you open the door and get in the door, and how wide is the door? And is there a clear route to the door? Is there a ramp? Well, describe the ramp. Is there a parking area? And they were always variations of the same questions, maybe with slightly different wording on each form, but you know, there was a recurring theme. Within this, we never need to ask about the search. It, unlike the archaeologists, we never need to search on the specific attributes within the JSON, though. The search is like, give me a, give me a state park. Show me what's around Lake Placid, but not give me all of the, uh, all of the gazebos with 40-inch doors, OK? So in the domain-driven design angle, that got me thinking that what I have is you know, an assessment, a structure as an entity, and these doors and ramps and things you know, are value objects that I would like to be able to compose each thing out of so that they would be a reusable part that I can plug in wherever it shows up. And I wonder if I could embed these reusable parts into the JSON. As it turns out, I could. I wanted something that would look like this. So this is an embeddable model, and everything tends to have a name. You know, door, oh, OK, door to you know, front door, back door. Some things have many doors, and very often a comment, and whether or not the thing has the thing in question. And then the door itself. Here we see an example. What I mean by when you control what an attribute is, because it's just going into the JSON, then you have more flexibility than you do with Active Record in order to customize what is in that attribute. So here, the first thing you see there, attribute door type is an enumeration. That is typically a drop-down list or a list of checkboxes. Maybe you can add another, which is multiple is true, means you can select many. And then I had another option is like strict is true, like you can only select from the list, or you can have extra you know, things. And dictionary, because there's different, you know, Open handle and close handle both come from a common dictionary of, of, uh, of door handle types. And then here we have a comfort station that has a door. Well, a lot of things have a door, so I just, you know, use single table inheritance for a specialty area, which is what a comfort station is called. And every specialty area gets the things that most everything seems to have. And then a comfort station has, doesn't actually explicitly have a door. It just got one from a specialty area. But as it turns out, restrooms and showers also have doors. And wherever a door needed to be, it was as simple as writing embeds one or embeds many doors. Or restroom or parking area or ramp or elevator or stairway and so forth. And then when you have a door form, then let's make it behave like uh, accepts nested attributes for wants it to behave so that you can assign the attributes. The form doesn't need to know that this isn't, these aren't actual columns and this isn't a real live active record model, but just a, a Ruby object with some attributes on it. And you can create a custom input, for example, in simple form. That's what this checkbox is other, and it hooks up to an enumeration with multiple true, and gives you something like this with the add other button. And suddenly, when we were looking at that and thinking, oh my god, half of these checkboxes have the other, and how are we going to do that? And suddenly, we, oh, enumeration, multiple true, and let's use the checkbox as other simple form input, and it was no longer a thing. And you know, this is in a partial, so whenever we need to plug in a door, we just call the partial, or actually call a helper that calls the partial with some special arguments. And then each door might have some slightly different hints or labeling on the form. Well, simple form gives you some wonderful uh, 
if tedious, but very handy specific ways to address that in the, you know, in the language file, okay? So if you want your non-active record model thing to behave with accept nest, like accept nested attributes for or does, all you gotta do is define a method that is your attribute name underscore attributes equals that receives what came in from the form and then builds out your array and sticks it in your JSON. Here I, I sh I'm showing you this just to show you how you can do a lot of tricking of active record to make it behave the way that it's supposed to behave with your non-active record thing because I don't want the form to have to know about it. I don't want the controller to have to know that the thing is a document store and not, and not a regular column, okay? So I found myself in this project pulling this out into a gem and using it since then on many other projects because now it's one of the tools in my toolbox. I'm putting it here both so you can take a look at it. I encourage you and would love some feedback on it. And also because if you want to see like how I, how I got from integer attributes to attribute, well, there it is. Uh, but I wanted to reflect more on some of the yeses and nos about the experience that I've had working with this JSON column, especially as a document store. It's emerged for me from using, finding a way to use single table inheritance and put all of the variant attributes into the document store, into the JSON column so that I don't have a thousand column table, which is probably a good indication that I shouldn't use single table inheritance but I didn't want to have to work with all the dependent models and stuff. This was just so easy and got the job done. And from the Inclusive Recreation Resource Center, IRRC, you see that it's handy for storing value objects and arrays and stuff, which means that it's good for what you probably think of when you think, oh, JSON, oh, I have some JSON. I need to do something with it. What should I do? Well, let's put it in a JSON column. Well, I was building a dashboard for our interacting with DigitalOcean and DNS Simple and, and uh, Bitbucket and what else, and you get back an API response. When I create a droplet, oh, okay, let's stuff it in the, in the JSON column, and there it is, along with the other attributes that I've already created. Uh, I'm in the flow of building out uh, some forms and, oh crap, I forgot to add that uh, field. I better generate a migration and, and here I just go to the model, pop it in there, you know, think, well, I regret this. If the answer is no, then it just goes, uh, <laughs> goes there and I move on. However, that last joke, I, I wanna emphasize that uh, it's not a permanent commitment, that there's ways to get into JSON, ways to get out of JSON, look at the JSON documentation in Postgres, nothing prevents you from running actual queries, even though you're using active record, and there's all kinds of cool things that you can do that I have not begun to talk about that I was going to talk about, but really I did not need to know about any of it in order to do the work that I've showed you so far, so why, uh, why talk about it here? But I would say more that it has the advantages of a document store. And all the usual, oh, you should use MongoDB because, and you can tell that Postgres uh, has been answering the MongoDB question with this, and the document store isn't the only thing they had in mind with it. A lot of the demos I see would have like, okay, you know, you, you have orders, and order, orders have line items. The line items don't really need to exist outside of the order, so why not put the line items within the JSON of the order? model, that was a, that's a pretty common example. And then they say, oh, but you have a context in which you want to access line items independently. Here's how you can write a query or create a materialized view that's going to pull all of the line items out of the models that they're stored in and present them to you as if they're in their own table. It's like, oh, okay. Uh, that's one of many things you can do with it. So it has the advantages, the speed, the, and it also has the uh, disadvantages of a document store. You know, all the projects in which I've used it had 
a big legacy database for which a large part of the project was to normalize it and sort out like, oh, we have a text column that's parading as a Boolean and they type in yes or no or Y or N or YN or NY or ES and, and it's like, no, people, uh, let's, uh, you know, and then figure out true or false. Once, you know, and then you have this big migration and then you've pushed the, pushed the boat off the dock and it goes out into the pond and up until the time you push the, that boat, migration, whatever, you know, I, I just, you know, there's going to be a migration, and as we go, we can, you know, add columns and add fields to the JSON to our heart's content. But once it's out there and you want to, say, change and move stuff around, then you have to go through all the documents and change them because there's no partial update. You can't say, update this key in my JSON and set the value. If, if the age is 40, set it to 42, because they're older now. You gotta go through and you gotta update the entire, you know, and save the entire record, okay? And in terms of, is the performance okay at the level, the number of records that I have? I don't notice a difference. Um, I would, you know, and I'm still working on the uh, question of performance in terms of if I have a lot, a lot of records, you know, what kinds of things. My, my, my performance questions are more of how much slower is this or how much faster that is this than if I wrote columns for all of the things that I'm putting into my document store. And I, what I found is if I'm looking up simple stuff like find this where that equals that, then it's pretty comparable. And if you're using JSONB with a gin index, it's actually faster. And that if you're doing something like greater than, less than, string matching, any more complex operation than equals, then in the JSON, it's actually going to be somewhat slower than if it was in a column, okay? And how much slower seems to progress as the number of records increases. Okay, so the more, J more records you have, the slower it gets when you're doing greater than, less than type stuff, which was important for Aragats, the archaeologists, and not relevant at all to the uh, IRRC. Also, I, when I was doing this testing, I totally did not expect to find this, but it, uh, I found that, be, if, let's say that you have the restrooms with the doors, let's say you have many restrooms and many doors, and then you have age up here just as a, as a key at the top level. The fact that that JSON is nested, for some reason, makes the entire, you know, a search even for the age become much slower. In other words, if you want to use the JSON, and you're going to use the indexing and all of that, of course, if searching on the keys in your JSON is going to be important to you, then don't nest JSON within the same column, okay? Because it just, it's like throwing in a wrench and I, anywhere from five to 60 times slower depending on the query and depending on how many records. And I didn't want that to be true, but I can't make, I, I keep looking, maybe I'm doing something wrong. But then I run a benchmark and it is still comes out slower. So I would like to go back to, you know, when we do human remains excavations in Aragats, I would like to turn grip handle into an object because it should be an, a value object. But if I do that, then the search performance is gonna suck. So I'm not going to do that. So where to go from here? I encourage you to check out my RDoc store gem. This is not a talk about that, but more how that emerged from the adventures that I had in rapid data modeling. And to, uh, I've put in some blog posts to learn more about the JSON column and other things you can do with it from there. And I encourage you to go and read them. And thank you for coming and uh, hearing about the JSON column. Once again, I'm David Ferber, and there I am at email and on Twitter, please, uh, Give me a holler. Thank you.